Amen. So keep your place there in 1 Thessalonians chapter number 4. We'll get there in just a minute. So we're looking at um, Daniel's 70th week. We're looking at our continued sermon series. Last week we talked about um, the tribulations. So we're going, basically we're going through um, the seals that are being opened right now in Revelation chapter number 6. We looked at the four horses um, in Revelation chapter 6, which correspond to the first four seals. Last week, we looked at the fifth seal, which is uh, this tribulation where we start to see these martyrs um, appear in heaven. They're, they're being killed in this tribulation period. And tonight, of course, that goes into the great tribulation. Then we look at, um, you know, the abomination of desolation is in there leading up to um, the great tribulation. We looked at that last week. So tonight, we're going to look at this idea or this um, event in the Bible um, called the rapture. Now, the word is not in the Bible, but it is described in 1 Thessalonians chapter number 4 on what it is. And I'm going to show you um, what it is and why it is and when it is in the Bible. Now, before I get started, let me just say this. I have a, I have a unique perspective on end times prophecy. I was Lutheran uh, the majority of my life into my 30s. And as a Lutheran, I was very interested and always very curious, not only about what the Bible said, but I always went to all the different Bible studies I could um, when I was at church, um, in the Lutheran church. And then I was always, uh, Revelation was a mystery to me. And the reason it was a mystery to me is because Revelation was actually a mystery to any Lutheran pastor that I ever knew. And most of the time I would get two responses. Rarely um, would you see a pastor that I grew up with or even was in in my adult years um, in the Lutheran church even mentioned the book of Revelation. And their two responses would be either that already happened already or, and I'm going to show you how you could accidentally misunderstand how um, you could think that things in the Bible already happened. And hopefully you're kind of already starting to see this methodology of shadow fulfillments. I'm going to show you that tonight again. And that's really kind of is the key to understanding a lot of Bible prophecy. But so they would either say, oh, that happened already. Or they would say, well, we just can't understand that. And of course, you can't understand that. If you're not saved, you have no chance of understanding things in the Bible, especially the most complicated things in the Bible. But all that to say this. When I got saved and I got into a Baptist church, my first church that I went to, I had no preconceived ideas about what end times prophecy was. How was it? Was it pre-tribulation rapture? Was it post-trib rapture? Was the, is it seven-year trib? What is it? You know, I, I really had no preconceived ideas. And the first church that I went to was an old IFB church, which are almost exclusively what we would call pre-tribulation rapture, meaning the rapture happens before the tribulation. All right, we're going to look, I'm just saying those words now is even weird, you know, before the tribulation. All right, but we're going to just look at what the Bible says. I tried when I was in the old IF, my, my first old IFB church to have the end times, Daniel's 70th week, so to speak, explained to me several times, and I have never to this day heard a coherent explanation of a pre-tribulation rapture view of end times prophecy of Daniel's 70th week. I want to show you simply tonight what the rapture is, where it's at in the Bible, when it's going to happen, how we, you know, I mean, what, what it's all about, and how clear the Bible is on this event. So let's look down. Hopefully you've got your chart in front of you. It's a very simple chart. Notice, I'm not making this chart overly complicated because these events in Daniel's 70th week, look, I'm not saying we're going to be able to know exactly what day tomorrow that all this is going to happen. But what I'm saying is, is that the order of events that take place in Daniel's 70th week is super clear in the Bible. If you are just reading the Bible and taking it for what it is. But what I've learned over the years is that people who have, you know, have this doctrine of a pre-tribulation rapture, they have it so indoctrinated in them, but it, it's almost like you cannot even talk to them logically. You cannot even show them simple things in the Bible because they've just got this dogma in them, just ingrained in them where they, they can't even see the words on the page for what they actually say. It's, it's, a, it's a strange thing. 
All right. But look down at 1 Thessalonians chapter number 4, and let's look at the kind of the quintessential verse uh, or passage in the Bible talking about what we would call the rapture. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, look at verse number 14. The Bible says this. It says, For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. So, first of all, just to get this out of the way, who are we talking about here? Who is we? Okay, who is we? Who are people that sleep in Jesus? These are people that, number one, is talking about people that have died saved, sleeping in Jesus, and people that currently believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. It's talking about saved people here. In, in all of these passages, it's going to be talking about saved people. For this we say unto you, by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain, we what? We saved Bible-believing Christians, people that believe on Christ and are sealed with the Holy Spirit, that we which are alive and remain under the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them which are asleep. Again, there's people that are dead in Christ, their souls are in heaven, their bodies are in the ground, they've not been physically resurrected yet into their glorified bodies. This is the first resurrection that we're going to be talking about here, which I'm not going to preach on tonight. I've preached on that extensively. Verse number 16, For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel, and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Now, my first actual, I knew what the rapture was when I was a Lutheran. My first actual, because I went searching for information about end times thing because I, things because I had interest in it, and my first you know, exposure to the rapture and end times uh, doctrine was the Left Behind books. All right? I read them all. I, there's over, I think there's over a dozen of them, but I read them all. It got really bored. But the point is, at the beginning, there's this, this rapture that happens, and it just takes everybody by surprise, and people just disappear. And everybody's wondering, where did everybody go? And it gets weird, you know, people's clothes are like setting, you know, in their chairs where they were. And, you know, it's strange. It's a, it's a book. It's a, a movie or whatever. But the point is, it was this big surprise. Nobody saw it coming. And that's what's being taught today by, with a pre-tribulation rapture, that Jesus could come tomorrow, that it could happen at any time. So, number one, it's imminent. It could happen at any time. But number two, it's just kind of this silent event where people just poof, disappear. Does this sound silent to you in verse number 16? It says, the Lord will descend from heaven with a shout, meaning everybody's going to hear this. And with the voice of the archangel and with the trump of God, there's three things right there saying that this is going to be announced. It's going to be announced. And the dead in Christ shall rise first. And then there's going to be all these people being resurrected. I, I don't think this is going to be, it's not really like poof. I don't hear poof in there anywhere. It's not, it, uh, we'll get to the imminency in just a minute, but the point is it's announced. It's a major thing. It's not going to be missed. It's like the Jehovah's Witnesses. They've, they've declared Jesus coming back incorrectly, I don't know how many times, throughout, you know, half a dozen times or more. In the Millerites back in the late 1800s or whatever the date was, um, that I, I mentioned in the sermon, the Millerites, you know, they finally got so sick of like, you know, falsely predicting the second coming of Christ that they just was like, oh yeah, it did happen. It did happen yesterday. Because everyone that came to church, it's like me predicting that Jesus is coming back Saturday and then we all show up Sunday and everyone's like, what's up, pastor? And I'm like, uh, 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 it did happen. You just missed it. This happened. This, is, this was what happened. These are modern-day Jehovah's Witnesses today. Like, here's the thing, folks. You weren't faithful enough. You weren't faithful enough, so God didn't come for you, or he didn't show you, or whatever, you know, they said. It's like, he did come, you just all missed it. And then everyone's like, you know, feels bad. They're like, oh, man, I need to be more faithful and all this. <laughs> I don't know what people said. But the point is, it's not going to be quiet. People are going to know that it's happening. All people. There's going to be... A shout. Look at verse number 18. It says, Wherefore, or, I'm sorry, verse number 17. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together, so the dead in Christ rise first. Then we are going to be, like, we're still there. And we're going to be caught up with Jesus. If you live, if you're alive during this time, verse number 17 is you. All right? We, we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. Because where is Jesus? He's in the clouds. He's like literally in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, so shall we ever be with 
the Lord. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. Why would we need comfort? Well, let's find out what was happening during this time right before the rapture took place. So look, the Bible is clear that Jesus is coming back to gather the saints, the saved, with him in the clouds and taking them to heaven. That's what the rapture is, okay? That's the what, all right? Now let's look at the when, all right? Is it imminent? Flip over to 2 Thessalonians chapter number 2. 2 Thessalonians chapter number 2. We knew a guy, there was a guy in the church that I went to, the old IFB church that I went to, that like just refused to get his act together in his life. And every time you would ask him, how's everything going? Like his whole family's falling apart. He has no job, all this stuff. We're like, hey, how's everything going, brother? Uh, he's just, did you, did you figure all that stuff out? Did you get some work, find some work, all this? Now I'm just waiting for Jesus to come get me. Literally, that's what he would say. So I, I mean, you kind of stop asking. He's just like, I'm just, I'm just waiting for Jesus to come get me. Just completely checked out on life and just waiting for Jesus to come, you know, like in five minutes or whatever. Well, he's going to be waiting a while. Look at 2 Thessalonians chapter number 2. Look at verse number 1. So the pre-trib rapture people will preach that it's imminent, that it's going to, it could occur at any time. What's the point? I'm going to show you the point of knowing all of these things, of knowing all the steps and the clues and the milestones. Why would Jesus give us all these things? Why would the Lord tell us all these details of these things that are going to happen, and then this is going to happen, and then this is going to happen, and then this is going to happen, and give us this order of things if it was just going to be imminent and none of it mattered? Look at verse number 1. It's 2 Thessalonians chapter number 2 and verse number 1. The Bible says, Now we beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, and by our gathering together unto him. We're clearly talking about the first Thessalonians chapter 4 event right here. All right? That should point that out. That ye be not soon shaken in mind, or be troubled, neither by spirit nor by word, nor by letter as from us, as that the day of Christ is at hand. So we see, uh, let's let the Bible kind of define things for us. We see the rapture now is called the day of Christ. It would be better, I guess, to just call the rapture the day of Christ or the day of the Lord, as we're going to learn in just a couple of minutes. But he defines 1 Thessalonians chapter number 4, that event where Jesus comes and gathers the saved as the day of Christ. All right? But he's warning them. He's saying, don't worry. Don't stress out. He's like, don't let people tell you and don't be like, this could happen at any moment. Don't don't live your life like, should I even go to work today? I mean, should I even, like, should I, I don't know, should I even function? Should I write the sermons for next week? I mean, Jesus could come back and then that's all wasted time. But he's saying, no, do not think that way. He's trying to calm them down. And look, I get it. I get it if somebody's preaching, you know, if Matthew 24 is preached the first time, and those guys are like, oh, man, this is going to happen in like a year. This is going to happen in our lifetimes. Of course, they would apply it to their lifetime. That's a natural thing. But G or the Bible here is saying, hey, don't live your life like it's at hand. Okay? Then he gives them even more detail. Look at verse number three. Let no man deceive you by any means. Because what do people do? What do people do? You know what sells the most books today? You know what sells books and movies and, and all that to, to, to Christians that know nothing about the Bible, end time stuff. You know, I would have like YouTube followers like you wouldn't believe if I would just get up here with a whiteboard and just make up a bunch of stuff and just act like I had extra revelation from whatever. Look, I could come up with some creative stuff. I'm a creative person and I have a technical mind. I could make some charts that would blow your mind. I'm telling you. And I would have hundreds of thousands of YouTube followers. But it would all be a lie. It would all be what? What is the Bible calling it here? Deception. It would all just be deception. Why do people deceive? Why are there false prophets? What would I get if I had a million YouTube followers? What would I get if I had two million YouTube followers and all this social media stuff and then I went and I just I pitched to those followers that I just wrote a book that's got all my latest charts in it. You know what I'd get? I'd get a lot of money. 
I would make merchandise of all of these people. Look, that's what all these people are doing on social media, folks. They're making merchandise of you. They're making merchandise. And that's what the Bible says false prophets do. This is what it's talking about. It said, let no man deceive you. And then he's telling you the answers here. He's saying, don't let anyone put some test in front of you that you don't know the answers to because I'm going to give you the answers. I'm going to tell you when this is going to happen. He says, for that day shall not come except there come a falling away first. Okay, now that's kind of a clue, right? Now that's not really a milestone, right? We could look at that. If the, if the verse ended right there, we'd all be like, man, the rapture's coming. Because, like, there's a falling away in the United States. Like, people in our country are abandoning God. They're abandoning the Word of God. They're abandoning the Bible. The culture's going south. But that's not all he says. Look what he says. And that man of sin be revealed. Who's that? That's the Antichrist. The son of perdition, who opposeth. Now look at verse number four. Knowing everything that you've known. When we've gone through clues and milestones and talked about the abomination of desolation and the very specific thing that is going to happen in the temple that the, the Antichrist is going to do, who opposeth and exalteth himself above all that is called God and that, or, that, or is worshipped, so that he as God sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. That is the abomination of desolation in Revelation chapter 13 and many other places in the Bible. Very clearly. So what is the Bible saying here? The rapture is not going to happen until that happens. So forget the tribulation for just a second. There is no way the rapture is imminent. No way. Because this has not happened yet. And that is a huge milestone. This world leader in Daniel 9 that is going to come and make a covenant with many, cause a world war to take over the entire government of the world. He's going to come and he's going to force into submission the nations that do not go along with him. And then at some point after that, he, after that battle is over, after he has gotten that global government, he's going to declare himself to be God in a temple that does not exist yet. It's not imminent. These things have not happened, and these things will not be missed when they start to happen. So look, we should be glad that we've studied what we've studied so far. That's why this Daniel 70th week sermon series, it's kind of like a, a 200, 300 level class where you kind of need those clues and milestone sermons to kind of decode the events of this final week. Turn to Zephaniah chapter number one. But let's look at this idea of day of Christ because when I have had pre-trib rapture people explain to me or attempt to explain to me the rapture, the pre-tribulation rapture, and end times events, they turn this day of Christ and day of the Lord into this, you have to have a secret decoder ring to figure this out. It is the, no, that's the day of, it's just, it's just like the book of life. No, 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 that's the book of life, and that's the Lamb's book of life. Wh what? I, I got news for you. Christ is the Lord. This is not hard doctrine. Christ is the Lord. Day of Christ, day of the Lord, same thing. The Bible is not this, this complicated code book where you have to have a pair of special glasses and read it like, oh, you know, I can see something that nobody else throughout history has seen. Or that nobody with the Holy Spirit, nobody with the Holy Spirit can read this except me and understand exactly which day of the, what the day of the Lord means, the day of Christ means. All the, the day of the Lord is the day of Christ. It's the same thing. It's talking about the rapture and shadow fulfillments of the rapture. It's not that hard. Look at Zephaniah chapter 1. Are you there? Look at verse number 14. The Bible says this. Let's see a day of the Lord here. All right? And then I want to show you just a clear pattern on how Bible prophecy works. And you should already know this, but I want to hit you with it one more time tonight. Look at Zephaniah chapter 1 and verse number 14. I want this church to be smart on this stuff. Look at Zephaniah 1, 14. The great day of the Lord is near. It is near and hasteth greatly, even the voice of the day of the Lord. The mighty men shall cry there bitterly. 
That day is a day of wrath. There's something new right there. There's something new right there. More information we were just given. A day of trouble and distress. A day of wasteness and desolation. A day of darkness and gloominess. A day of clouds and thick darkness. A day of the trumpet and alarm against fenced cities and against the high towers. And I will bring, does this sound like a fun time right here? It sounds like, like a lot of fun for the people in this city. No, it's a day that is a day of wrath and a day of God's judgment. Look at verse number 17. I will bring distress upon men and they shall walk like blind men. And because they have what? It even tells us why God's mad. <laughs> There's nothing left to the imagination here because they've sinned against the Lord and their blood shall be poured out as dust and their flesh as the dung. Neither shall their silver nor their gold be able to deliver them the day of the Lord's wrath. So the day of the Lord can also be called the day of the Lord's wrath, the Bible's saying here. The day of the Lord's wrath. But the whole land shall be devoured by the fire of his jealousy, for he shall make even a speedy riddance of all them that dwell in the land. So look, what do we learn here? Turn to Joel chapter 1. What do we learn in this passage in Zephaniah? We learn that the day of the Lord is bad for the men that have sinned against the Lord. And it's a day that has God's wrath coming behind it. All right, look at Joel chapter 1 and verse number 15. Joel chapter 1 and verse number 15. The Bible says in Joel 1, 15, it says, Alas for the day, for the day of the Lord is at hand, and as a destruction from the Almighty shall it come. Now, in Acts chapter 2, we see a kind of a, a, a retelling or a requoting of Joel chapter 2 and verse 31. I'll read for you the Acts 2 version in verse 17. You can go to Joel 2, 31. It shall come to pass in the last days, saith God, I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh. Your sons and daughters shall prophesy. And your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. And on my servants and on my handmaidens I will pour out in those days of my spirit, and they shall prophesy. Look at verse number 19. And I will show wonders in heaven above, and in signs in the earth beneath, blood and fire and vapor of smoke. So now we see here something different as well, that the day of the Lord, um, the day of the Lord, the day of Christ, the day of the Lord, the day of the Lord's wrath, it, there's going to be signs in heaven, the Bible says. And then look at verse number 20 of Acts chapter 2. You're looking at Joel uh, 2.31. The sun shall be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before the great and notable day of the Lord come. Turn to Joel chapter 3. Joel chapter number 3. So the Bible here is talking about the day of Christ, the day of the Lord. Look at Joel chapter 3 and verse number 14. The Bible says, Multitudes, multitudes in the valley of decision, for the day of the Lord is near in the valley of decision. Look, are you recognizing a pattern here? You have God's prophets. They are telling you the day of the Lord is here. The day of the Lord is here. But then they're throwing in Bible prophecy about the day of the Lord. It's exactly like the abomination of desolation. It's exactly like many other prophecies. There's shadow fulfillments. So the actual fulfillments during these times, during these prophets, were the northern kingdom of Israel being taken into captivity by the Assyrian by the Assyrian army. That's the, that's, that was the day of the Lord for that nation. And then you have prophets of Judah prophesying that the day of God's judgment, the day of God's wrath, the day of the Lord's wrath is almost upon them. Babylon, Babylonian, the Babylonian empire is going to take them into captivity. God's done with them. God's going to take them out of what? Out of the land. So that is the immediate fulfillment. But there is going to be the day of the Lord. And that's when we see the sun turned into darkness, the moon into blood, before the great and notable day of the Lord come. That's the end times day of the Lord. So it's easy for people to say, oh yeah, well, you know, that day of the Lord, you know, that was just talking about uh, the northern kingdom of Israel being taken in by, you know, taken into, you know, being wiped out by the Assyrian Empire. Well, that's lazy, and that doesn't account for the sun and moon turned to darkness. That doesn't account for, again, what I've said is, if, as long as the book of Revelation wasn't in the Bible, you know, you could, might be able to get away with that stuff a little bit easier. But Revelation is in the Bible. And we get all this great detail about the day of the Lord, about the rapture, about the abomination of desolation, and the actual end times 
events that are the real, you know, prophecies here. All right. Again, in Joel uh, three fourteen, the sun and moon shall be darkened, and the stars shall withdraw their shining. So we have shadow fulfillments of God's wrath upon nations, and that's what the Bible here is calling the day of the Lord, the day of God's wrath. These cities, these nations, you know. But then we see this sign of the day. Turn to Genesis chapter number one. We see this sign of the day of the Lord, which is going to, you know, begin God's wrath against what? Against the whole world in the end times, all right? And it makes perfect sense that the sun and moon are darkened and we see signs in the stars. Why? Here's why. Because that's what God said the sun and the moon and the stars are for. They're not for us to look up and be like, oh, is there aliens there? Is there super civilizations up there? You know, I mean, they don't sound like that. You know, they sit and, you know, they have their, their glasses. Yes, there's a super civilization, we believe, planet NG5679. But really, what they sound like to me is like, duh, bunch of aliens. No, that's not what the sun, moon, and stars are there for. They're there. Look at Genesis chapter 1. The Bible literally says, hey, you could have not wasted your whole life if you just would have read the first chapter of Genesis. One chapter, whole life saved. Whole life not wasted. Look at verse number 14. And God said, let there be lights in the firmament of heaven to divide the day from night and let them be for, we only have to read, you only have to read the first 14 verses of the Bible. Let them be for signs and for seasons, for days and years. Obviously, it's a clock. It's a clock. It's a calendar. It's for seasons. It's for the climate. It's for, which means like, we're not going to wreck the climate. God's going to take the whole thing down, not us. But what's the first thing? He says, for signs. You know what that means? For communications. For communications. For comms. God's like, I'm going to tell you what's going to happen in the Bible, and then you're literally going to look up in the heavens, and you're going to see it happen so you know that the Bible's true. And you know that that's why God said, what did he say? He said, watch. He said, watch in Matthew chapter or Mark chapter 13. He said, watch in Matthew chapter 24. Watch for the things in Matthew 24, not little green men. Watch for these things that I'm explaining to you because I put these things there for signs. It's for us to see. But see, we can't, we can't think that it was all built for us because then we have to look to the Bible and we have to look at who built it, and we have to look at what he said. So look, there's an agenda behind that. I get that. All right? But the point is this. They're there for signs, and this is a huge sign that God is using the sun, the moon, and the stars for. It's to show us these things. It's to show us these things. Turn to Matthew chapter 24. So we're talking about when the day of the Lord is, when the day of Christ is, when this final day of wrath is. And look, there could be, look folks, there could be a day of the Lord on the United States of America that is not the end times. That's right. yeah. Don't think that, oh, we're America, we must be in the end times. No, we could just be the day of the Lord done. Next nation. Because right. that's what happens to all these other nations. We ourselves could be a shadow fulfillment. Yeah. So we have to understand that. Look at Matthew chapter 24. But the Bible is very clear on when the end times, the final day of the Lord, will be. And the Bible says this in Matthew 24, in verse number 29. It says, immediately after the tribulation of those days. And how do we know that this is talking about the tribulation and then the rapture? Well, look at the next few words. The sun shall be darkened, and the moon shall not give her life, light, and the stars shall fall from heaven. You think we're going to miss that? And the powers of the heavens shall be shaken, and then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. Amen. And then shall all the tribes of the earth mourn, and they shall see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. Why are they going to mourn? Here's why they're going to mourn, because they rejected him. Yeah, right. yeah. It's not going to be us mourning. It's not going to be the people that are alive and remain that are mourning. It's all the tribes of the earth the vast majority of the earth that is not saved. 
that does not believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and they're going to look up, and who are they going to see? Jesus Christ, and they're going to be like, oh, man, we're in a lot of trouble. That's, the, that's where the mourning is going to come from. So look at your chart. Is this hard to understand? After the tribulation of those days, the sun and moon will be darkened. It's not hard to understand. You say, is this in Revelation? Is the rapture in Revelation? I googled, Bard AI, is the rapture in Revelation? Turn to Revelation chapter 3. Our artificial intelligence found it. All right? Turn to Revelation chapter number 3. Revelation chapter number 3. And look at verse number 10. Revelation chapter 3. So you Google this, and the vast majority of people that believe the pre-tribulation rapture will point you to Revelation chapter 3. Many of them will point you to Revelation chapter 4 of the, the 24 elders, which makes no sense. There's 24 of them. There's more. I'm looking at more than 24 saved people tonight, all right? So maybe it's just us. I don't know. But <laughs> maybe, there's, maybe there's some. Maybe it's just us. See, I told you I could put a good chart together. I could put a good create. It's just us, and there's a few unsaved people in here. We're going to have to find them. Okay, no, I'm just kidding. All right, look at Revelation chapter 3. Look at verse number 10. This is the rapture. Look at verse number 10. Because thou hast kept the word of my patience, I will also keep thee from the hour of temptation, which shall come upon all the world to them that to try them that dwell upon the earth. See, there it is. You're like, what? Listen, you just, I, you don't know the Bible as well as me. This is talking about, uh, you know, that we're not going to, look, 1 Thessalonians 5 says we're not appointed to wrath. And this is talking about how we're not appointed to wrath. And we're not going to go through that. And we're all Jews. And I don't even know what I'm talking about right now. But this is kind of how it goes. It makes no sense. That has nothing to do with any kind of rapture. It doesn't mention the rapture. It doesn't mention anything. Again, they just go back. We're not appointed to wrath, but again, apples are not oranges. You know, basketballs are not hockey sticks. You know, I don't know. Wrath is not tribulation. They are not the same thing. Right? That's a pretty big mistake. All right? But let's look at what the Bible actually says. Go to Revelation chapter number 6. Now that we know the day of the Lord, the day of Christ, they're all the same thing. It's talking about bringing in God's wrath, whether a shadow fulfillment on a nation or a city, or the day of the Lord, going to bring God's wrath upon the whole earth. But before that happens, of course, we're not appointed to wrath, folks. Jesus is going to come and take us out of there first. All right, and I'm going to show you exactly where that's at in the Bible. Look at Revelation chapter 6, and let's continue our Bible study of Daniel's 70th week. Look at verse number 12. So we've gone through the first four seals, and then the fifth seal, which is the literal tribulation in Revelation chapter 6. Beheld, and I beheld when he opened the sixth seal. And lo, there was a great earthquake, and the sun, look at this. The sun became black as a sackcloth of hair, and the moon became as blood, and the stars of heaven fell onto the earth. Is there any doubt in your mind that these passages are all talking about the same event? Even as a fig tree casteth her untimely figs when she is shaken of a mighty wind. Meaning these stars are just going to come down. And the Bible says in verse 14, The heaven departed as a scroll when it is rolled together, and every mountain and island removed out of their places. This is a huge event. This is a huge event heavenly event involving the sun, the moon, and the stars. I mean, if this was like a different event every single time, would that be a good sign? If like the moon, you know, uh, well, the moon, we do have blood moons every now and then. We do have red moons, and then people write a book and say, oh, look at this. You know, it's the end times is here. But the point is, if the sun was darkened and the stars fell from the sky like every three years, would this sign be any value to anyone? No. This is an extremely rare one-time event that no one is going to miss, all right? So we can point to all these different places in the Bible that describe this exact event and say, this is what it's talking about. And the kings of the earth and the great men, the rich men and the chief captains, remember, people aren't going to be able to buy their way out of this with silver and gold. The mighty men, every bondman, every free man, hid themselves in the dens and the rocks of the mountains. So here we see these people mourning. They're scared. They're afraid. And said to the rocks and the mount mountains and rocks, fall on us. And hide us from the face of him that sitteth on the throne and from the what comes with the day of the Lord and the rapture. The wrath of the Lamb. Who's the Lamb? Christ, the Lord, the Lamb. All the same thing. 
All the same person, Jesus Christ. For the day of his wrath, does this all fit together perfectly, is come. And shoot, who shall be able to stand? The day of his wrath? The day of the Lord's wrath? Same thing. I mean, everybody, they, all these pre-trib rapture people, they take all these different ways of saying the same thing, and they create a different path and different doctrine for every way. You're like, no, Christ, the Lord, the Lord's wrath, the day of, it's all the same thing. It's all exactly the same. Turn to Revelation chapter 7. So we see the sign in heaven, the sun, the moon, the stars, we see these signs. Now what happens? How do we know it's chronological as we skip over to Revelation chapter 7, by the way? Well, let's just read the Bible. And after these things, complicated. And after these things, I saw four angels. After what things? After the things that just happened in Revelation chapter 6. I saw four angels standing on the four corners of the earth, holding the four winds of the earth, that the wind should not blow on the earth, nor on the sea, nor on any tree. What's about to happen? God's wrath is winding up here. The Bible literally said in, at the end of Revelation chapter 6 that the great day of his wrath has come. But look, the, the exact minute of the wrath is not here. The day is here. I saw another angel ascending from the east, having the seal of the living God. And he cried with a loud voice to the four angels to whom it was given to hurt the earth and the sea, saying, hurt not the earth, neither the sea nor the trees, till we have sealed the servants of God in their foreheads. He's saying, don't do it yet. He's saying, don't do it yet. It's important that we understand this chronological order of events here. So now... There's this event, this milestone of the 144,000 being sealed in their foreheads. And it goes through and it, and it talks about how 12,000 of each tribe is sealed in their foreheads. But skip down to verse number 9. Right after the 144,000 are sealed in their foreheads, look at verse number 9. It says, and after this I beheld, and lo, a great multitude which no man could number of all nations and kindreds and people and tongues. Tongues means they speak all kinds of different languages. Why? Because they're from different nations. Stood before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed in white robes and palms in their hands, and cried with a loud voice, saying, Salvation to our God, which sitteth upon the throne and unto the Lamb. So here we have this event where all of a sudden all these people, this great multitude that can't be numbered from everywhere in the world, in the world. Where are people saved today? In all nations around the world, there's saved people. Yep. Because the gospel has made it all around the world. Funny how that kind of fits in there too. But the gospel has been preached all around the world. There are saved people in every nation and all these people, this great multitude that no man can number, show up suddenly in heaven. And just so we can understand like who they are, the Bible literally answers who these people are. How you could miss this is unbelievable. Somebody who didn't really have any end times theology, when you read this, it just, it makes perfect sense. Look at verse number 11. It says, and the angel stood around about the throne and the elders, these are the 24 elders, by the way. So the 24 elders, they are not the great multitude. Because they're different. They're, first of all, 24 is not a great multitude. But if you struggle with that, they're clearly different groups of people right in this chapter. Saying, amen, blessed and glory and wisdom, thanksgiving and honor and power and might. Unto our glory, unto our God forever, amen. And one of the elders answered, one of the elders said, answered, saying unto me, what are these which are arrayed in white robes, and whence came they? So literally the elders that some people teach are the raptured saints ask who these raptured saints are. So obviously they're not the raptured saints, but then the Bible actually answers who these people are. And I said unto him, sir, thou knowest, and he said unto me, these are they which came out of great tribulation and have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. These are the people that were in the great tribulation at the point where God said, that's enough. My wrath has come now. And Jesus comes and he gets the, the, the sleep in Jesus. He gets the people who are alive and remain who are in the great tribulation at that moment. That is so bad, the Bible says, that if it wasn't shortened, and it's shortened by the rapture, if it wasn't shortened, none of them would survive. Except those days be shortened, the Bible says. None of them would, be, none of them would survive. They would all be killed. But they're saved out of the great tribulation by the rapture.
So if you look at the chart, the tribulation, the man of sin declares himself to be God, Revelation chapter 13. The abomination of de desolation, the mark of the beast, he demands that people worship him. The sun and moon are darkened, and then the rapture. Now, Revelation is laid out from Revelation chapter 1 to Revelation chapter number 11. But then it starts over in Revelation chapter 12 and tells, it's, many, it's, it's much like two Gospels accounts. It tells, a different, it tells the same, a, a lot of the same things, but different details in the first half and the second half. But it's talking about the same timeline. So you would think, if that's the case, that Revelation, or the rapture would be in Revelation chapter 12 through 22 as well. Well, it is. Turn to Revelation chapter 14. Turn to Revelation chapter 14. Now remember what we just saw. Remember what, now I didn't put the 144,000 in um, the chart, but it basically would be the, the 144,000 are sealed, the sun and moon are darkened, and the sun and moon are darkened, the 144,000 are sealed, then the rapture, all right? And then we see God's wrath, all right? Look at verse number one of Revelation chapter number 14. Sun and moon are darkened, the rapture happens, and the 144,000 are sealed right around that same time. But look at verse number one. It says, And lo, a lamb stood on Mount Zion, and with him 144,000. We're talking about the same thing. It's a perfect match to Revelation chapter number six and chapter number seven. Having his father's name written in their foreheads, they're sealed in their forehead. And I heard a voice from heaven. This proves to you that as the Gospels, you know, show different details in each Gospel. No contradicting details. We also get more detail about the 144,000. This is what really makes the Jehovah's Witnesses wanting to claim that they're one of the 144,000 really seem foolish. It says, And they sung as a new song before the throne and before the four beasts and the elders, and no man could learn the song but the 144,000, which were redeemed from the earth. These are they which are not defiled with women, for they are virgins. These are they which follow the Lamb whither, whithersoever that he goeth. So these are male virgins, all right? And I'm not going to get into this. I've preached on this before. But this shows a perfect match. This shows us where we are in the timeline as compared to the, the first telling of Revelation in Revelation 1 through 11. These were redeemed from among men, being the first fruits unto God and to the Lamb. So it's really curious when you meet a Jehovah's Witnesses that's especially a woman that thinks that she's, um, you know, one of the 144,000. You're like, What? You know, but they don't care what the Bible says, and we understand that. But look at verse number five. That's one thing, you know, about, like, religion. Like, if you just don't care what the Bible says, you can create all kinds of fun stuff. You can just pretty much do whatever you want. It's like a creative writing class. Look at verse number five. In their mouth was found no guile, for they are without fault before the throne of God. And I saw another angel fly into the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach unto them that dwell on the earth, and to every nation, and kindred, and tongue, and people. So this is the purpose of the 144,000, just a little extra detail there. They're given the gospel to go down to the earth during God's wrath to preach the gospel. I mean, God's pretty merciful. He's coming down to lay down his wrath on the earth, but he's going to send some witnesses down so the gospel can still be preached during that wrath. That's the purpose of the 144,000. Skip down to verse number 14 for sake of time. And I looked and beheld a white cloud, and upon the cloud one sat like unto the Son of Man. That's Jesus, folks, having the head, on his head a golden crown, his hand a sharp sickle. And another angel came out of the temple crying with a loud voice to him that sat on the cloud, Thrust in thy sickle and reap, for the time has come for thee to reap, and the harvest of the earth is ripe. He's saying it's time to go get those people down there in that tribulation. And he sat on the cloud, he that sat on the cloud, thrust in the sickle on the earth, and the earth was reaped. There is the rapture in Revelation chapter number 14. At the exact same time that it is in Revelation chapter number 7. Right after the sun and moon are darkened, the 144,000 are sealed, the rapture happens right around the same time, and then God is about to unleash his wrath. All right, turn to Amos chapter 5. Let me just show you. Let me just show you in Amos chapter 5. Let me just beat this in one more time so you just kind of understand this idea of shadow fulfillment so nobody can fool you about these things. But look at Amos chapter number 5. Amos chapter number 5. Look at verse number 20. Amos chapter number 5. Towards the end of the Old Testament, Amos chapter 5. Look at Amos chapter 5, verse number 20. The Bible says, Shall not the day of the Lord be darkness and not light? and even very dark and no brightness in it. Again, showing that the day of the Lord is not going to be a great day. 
all right, for most people. I hate, I despise your feast days. I will not smell in your solemn assemblies. Though ye offer me burnt offerings and your meat offerings, I will not accept them. Neither will I regard the peace offerings of your fat beasts. Again, it's showing the same exact thing here in the day of the Lord, that none, uh, nothing of your wealth or your power or the kings of the earth is going to save you in the day of the Lord. Take away from me the noise of thy songs, for I will not hear the melody of thy vials. But let judgment run down as waters, and righteousness as a mighty stream. Have ye offered unto me sacrifices and offerings in the wilderness forty years, O house of Israel? But ye have borne the tabernacle of your Moloch and Chion, your images. This is pretty specific here. He's talking to a specific nation. He literally just said Israel. But what's he talking about? The literal nation of Israel. The northern kingdom of Israel. How do I know that? Therefore, I will cause you to go into captivity beyond Damascus, saith the Lord, whose name is the God of hosts. He's talking about the literal Assyrian destruction of the northern kingdom in this chapter. And it's called, it's called the day of the Lord. So the point is this. These prophets, Amos, talking about the northern kingdom of Israel, Joel, Zephaniah, talking about the southern kingdom of Judah. They're talking about the coming of God's wrath on those specific nations. It's literally, I mean, look, this is the pattern of the Old Testament. God is telling, and why is that in the Bible? So all nations that ever exist on the earth will understand that any nation, even heathen nations that turn against the Lord or hate the Lord will be destroyed by the Lord. And that is, when that destruction comes upon that city, that nation, whatever it is, that's the day of the Lord's wrath upon that nation, upon that city, whatever it is. But in the end times, there is going to be a great and notable day of the Lord that affects the entire earth before God unleashes his wrath, his judgment on what? On the entire earth. And who's in charge of the entire earth at that point? The Antichrist. We've had many Antichrist leaders. You could argue that most leaders throughout history have been Antichrist. But there will be the beast, the Antichrist, the false prophet that followed these specific events. And then there will be one great day of the Lord. But it's all the same patterns. It's all the same patterns. It's just on a bigger level. And the rapture, the reason for it, is because, as the pre-tribbers will tell you, we are not given to wrath. We are not appointed to wrath. So God takes us out right before he unleashes the wrath. Go to 1 Thessalonians, um, go to 1 Thessalonians chapter number 4. Let's kind of end where we started here. So look, hopefully, hopefully this is sort of simple. You know, hopefully this is sort of simple. I mean, it's just, it's, look, it's the, same, it's the same thing that you see with the gospel, folks. What do people do? They just, they complicate the simplicity of Christ. They take something that is simple and they just make it super complicated. But people complicate to confuse on purpose. People complicate to confuse so that you just think that the person saying that is like, some super smart person and just like I'm just not as smart as him but it sure sounds like he knows what he's talking about like people are pretty good salesmen with this today all right but look look at first Thessalonians chapter four, uh, four actually look at verse number five so a lot of people are like oh yeah but it's gonna the Bible says it'll come as a thief in the night let me address this very quickly you know you have to read more than just one verse at a time in the Bible too but of the times and seasons, brethren, have ye no need that I write unto you? For you, you yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so cometh as a thief in the night. For when they shall say peace and safety, then sudden destruction come upon them. But who's saying peace and safety? Who's saying peace and safety? In the Old Testament, in Jeremiah's time, in all the times before this day of the Lord, before this judgment came upon the lower, uh, lower kingdom of Judah and the northern kingdom of Israel, who was saying peace and safety? It was the false prophets that were saying peace and safety because they became the popular ones. Kind of sounds like today. People out there saying peace, peace, and safety. God likes you just as you are. 
hey, no big deal, fornication, perversion, wherever you want, come as you are. Wrong! That's not what the Bible says. The Bible says that a nation that goes into these things and just abandons the Word of God is going to be out of the land. I don't care if you're Jewish or Muslim or whatever, you turn on God and you're going to be out of the land. Obviously, that made no sense because all those people have turned on God. But the point is, turn on God, you're out of the land. Turn on God, the day of the Lord is coming for your nation and your city. Period. All right? But look at verse number, uh, verse number four. So peace, peace, and safety, then sudden destruction come upon them. So it's the people that are not saved that are saying everything's fine. But ye, brethren, ye, brethren, the saved, he's saying ye, he's talking to a plural group of saved people, are not in darkness that the day should overtake you as a thief. It's not going to be a surprise to you. Right. Yep. That's what he's saying. Right. He's saying to the vast majority of unsaved people, it's going to come as a thief in the night. But you, it's not. Yep. Why? Because I'm telling you this stuff. Because I'm giving you the answers to the test. So no one can fool you. No one can deceive you. Look, this is why God gave us end times prophecy. Yeah. We're saved. And we should be out working. We should be out working and, and spreading the gospel no matter what. Amen. No matter what's going on in the world, we should be out there spreading the gospel. Amen. He just gave us end times prophecy so we can, we can see the heretics. So we cannot be deceived and distracted by all the false prophets that are out there spewing all this garbage. All right? Yep. So look. And then, you know, a lot of people, they'll say like, oh, Mark 24 and uh, Mark 20, uh, Matthew 24, Mark 13 is just about the Jews and all this. Like, but here's the thing, like, that's just like not in the Bible at all. Like, you just made that up, though. You can't just say stuff. You know, you don't just get to, like, say, like, oh, yeah, but this is just about the Jews. Like, that doesn't even make any sense. I mean, the Bible says, watch. He's clearly, I mean, turn to Matthew 24. Turn to Matthew 24. I mean, there's so many things in Matthew chapter number 24. I mean, he's saying, I mean, just look at the, I know you all know this, but I mean, just look at nation shall rise against nation. Um, they shall deliver you up to kill you. Who's he talking about? You shall be hated of all nations, verse 9, for my name's sake. He's talking to saved people. Who's going to be hated of all nations for my name's sake? Uh, Jews who don't even believe in Jesus? What, what are you talking about? <laughs> it's like, it's talking about saved people here that are going to be persecuted and go through this tribulation because they're saved. Literally, that's what it's saying. Then it just talks about Many, uh, many false prophets shall deceive many. Not just th th that it's just the Jews. And then Mark 13, li literally the, the, the parallel chapter to, the, to Matthew 24, literally says, like, what I say to you, I say to all. Yep. Watch. It's, the Bible applies to everybody. That's the miracle of the Bible. The miracle of the Bible is it's the only book ever written that applies to every single person that's ever lived. That's the miracle of the Bible. But look, folks, I mean, when people start saying stuff like that, you just got to be like, what are you talking about? The Bible isn't this code book that, you know, only certain specific people can decipher, you know, with their, with their secret decoder ring, you know. But look, it's simple. It's simple. The man of sin will come on the scene. He will make this covenant. He will start this war. You will see this massive war of destruction to get this global government. He will declare himself to be God. There's tribulation during that war. He hates the believers the whole time he comes on the scene. And then he declares himself to be God, and then he really starts wiping out the, the believers. And it's so bad that if Jesus didn't come back and rapture the saints, that none of them would survive, the Bible says. But Jesus does come back. Amen. And he does come and get the saints. And he does come, and you know that first resurrection happens, and then we see God's wrath begin on the earth. Very simple, very easy to understand just by reading the Bible. So now, in the coming weeks, we're going to be looking at the wrath of God as it begins on the earth. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you for um, this great detail in the Bible. I thank you for this great, just clear um, chronology of events, Lord, so we're not confused, we're not deceived. Um, I thank you for the Holy Spirit so we can just look at the Bible and see it clearly. Um, Lord, I just pray that you just help us to...